So let's start quantitative methods. Uh, the the lectures that we're going that I'm going to to present to you are about quantitative methods. So they're not about the course, let's say in general, right? The course of research methods that involves other stuff, and I guess that Kali is also going to deal with some stuff with you, like in terms of the methods for data gathering, for example, or qualitative methods for for analyzing data and so on, but. For us specifically, we're going to talk about quantitative methods, uh, about data, about statistics, and things like that, right? And today, more more importantly, the lecture is well, it's it's an introduction to the whole thing, so it's a, like a conceptual, general overview and and uh, placement of some sub some concepts, some ideas, and everything. But also, it's about um, getting you guys acquainted with the stuff that you need for writing your data collection proposal right i've been getting some some of them already so uh some of you have sent me some proposals already and we're going to talk about that but um but i i consider that now let's say it's like the official kickstart so to speak of the of the proposal right so overview how do we conduct media media technology research anyway uh, this is this, although like uh, science is, well, most uh, subjects have a lot of overlap in terms of scientific methods. Still, each area has its own uh, quirks, let's say, its own way of doing certain things. And of course, research means different things depending on the area that you're doing research. In our case, it's media technology. And which, which doesn't help much, unfortunately, because media technology is such an abstract and open term. Uh, it's not even well defined um, as far as I know. Uh, it's not, you don't find it uh, everywhere. Some, some uh, universities, some people will just break them down, break media technology down into smaller things like interaction design or human computer interaction, things like that, web development and so on. Uh, and, and then use those terms instead. So we, we use the term media technology here and, and unfortunately it's, it's a little bit abstract and open. So it's kind of broad, it includes a lot of stuff, right? So it's not super easy to determine exactly what is media technology research. But I, I created a little bit of this uh, very, well, I, actually I, I didn't create, I, I do, did some research and I came up with this general view on what media technology research can be thought as. Um, even though, again, it's super overly simplified and, and general. But in, in, in many ways, I guess it fits um, the, the work that you're supposed to do in, in your thesis and everything. Uh, so it, it mixes up a little bit with this thing, design thinking, for example, because usually, well, usually what we do in media technology is to design something or design a solution to a problem, right? But not, to, not just to any problem, to, to problems uh, that come from more or less from a specific uh, little, um, with some specific constraints, let's say, right? So one way of thinking about media technology research is to see it as a quest to solve user-centered problems through the novel design of media-based solutions, right? So solve user-centered problems. What does that mean? Well, that means that whatever problem that you're trying, whatever is the problem that you're trying to solve, it is based on the need of a user, like the user of a computer or the user of a mobile phone or the user of, a, of some kind of technological interface, uh, hardware or something like that. So it's, it's a user-centered problem. You're trying to solve this, the problem of a user and you try to, and, and, but not just in any way, right? You're not just trying to solve problems, period. You're, you're trying to solve it through the novel design of media-based solutions. So in order to solve this problem, you want to design some new solution. And that solution is media-based. What is media? Media can be so many things, right? But you're, you're designing a certain solution to a user-centered problem. That's still very general, but it kind of narrows it down a little bit because you're not just doing anything. You're, there's a specific type of problem that you're trying to solve and there's a specific type of constraint in, the, in what solution you're trying to, 
to come up with, right? So in general, according to this uh, website that has uh, discussions on interaction design, which is actually quite an interesting website that you can take a look at. Again, it's not specifically about media technology. It's not like this is media technology, but it, it kind of goes in the same direction, right? <clears throat> so for example, the first step would be to empathize with your user because this is a user-centered problem. So you, you need to empathize in terms of understand a little bit how is it that this user thinks or what is the kind of uh, tasks that they perform in the whatever is the, the uh, media that you're trying to, to design a solution for, right? So if it's computers, if it's web, uh, if they're using the web or if it's a mobile, if it's whatever, what kind of, whatever kind of uh, uh, media that this user is interfacing with, and what kinds of tasks that they are doing that. You, you just have to kind of understand that a little bit. And then there's define. Define would be, and it's interesting that this, this icon is very, very interesting because define basically means, okay, out of all the things that this user is doing, I'm not gonna solve everything, right? I'm gonna solve one specific thing. So I have to define what's the problem. And the bullseye here works nicely because then you're at this point, you're like, okay, I have to be concrete because I have to find the specific problem that I'm solving, right? Among all the possible problems that this, this person, this, this user has, which maybe it's a lot, but I'm, I'm only going to focus on one, right? Then you define the problem and then you, then that, then comes the, the time to have an idea about how to solve it, right? And this is also very interesting to, it's very interesting to separate these two things. And this is something that not everyone does um, in their thesis, but I would say that if you do it, that makes things much, much, much more interesting and more mature, let's say. Because when you have a problem, you could come up with a problem and there could, that problem could have thousands of different ways of being solved. Even though, even though not, it's not always clear because since, since we're doing many things at the same time, sometimes it seems like a certain problem has only one solution and that solution is the one that we're gonna make. Like the problem and the solution kinda, kinda go hand in hand when we think about things. But the truth is that for one specific problem, there could be potentially many different solutions. So maybe if I give a problem to you guys and, and, and the same problem to everyone, maybe each one of you will come up with a different idea of how to solve that problem. Right, so the problem remains the same, the, the the one that the one that you defined, but the idea on how to solve that problem, that is usually very different depending on on the person who is actually going to design and implement the solution. Right, so that's why these things are different, the problem and the idea for the solution. Well, of course they're different, but I mean it's important to to keep them uh, apart and to think of the problem as something that can be solved in many different ways. Then comes the prototype. I guess that's straightforward. I mean, you have an idea and then you want to implement it. Again, you could think that, well, the same idea could be implemented in different prototypes by different people. But anyway, it's, it's not that important to discuss that as long as you know, we understand that there's an idea and then you prototype that. And then comes testing. And this is basically where we will focus our course. Let's say the, the, the part where we are where we are uh, considering this course is the testing part. Now, of course, you could say that the whole thing is research, right? Empathizing, defining the problem, having an idea, all of this could be considered within this, the framework of the scope of a research project. But we're going to talk about quantitative methods and these are in the testing phase, okay? for us, so this is our focus. We're testing something that has been developed based on an idea, based on a problem. So, and what does it mean to test? Well, it means exactly what, it's very straightforward. I want to test whether my idea and the prototype that implements my idea actually works or, or if it actually reaches the goal that I set up in the beginning. So my goal was to solve a problem or at least to improve a little bit a certain situation that 
is going on, right? A certain problem. I'm not, maybe I won't solve that problem like completely, but I will improve on something related to that problem. Whatever was your goal, you have to test it at the end, right? And uh, the truth is that unfortunately, you, you, sometimes you get so many theses without the testing phase. So because it's hard, first of all, to do it, it's hard to gather data. It's hard, it's, hard to, it's hard to do it correctly. It's hard to, to know what to do with the data after you've gathered it. Um, and the whole process is complicated. And of course, it's the last part. So if the four previous steps don't go as planned, when you get to the end, the last part will always end up being either compressed or ignored, right? But the truth is that I, I mean, theoretically, you couldn't really call a research project a, some research if you don't have the test because the test, the tests are the test is provides your results, right? In a way, like you cannot just say that. Well, I, impr I implemented this thing and this is my result. Yeah, I mean, you implemented it, but we have no idea whether if if what you implemented actually makes any sense. I mean, uh, yeah, I built something, cool, but does it actually solve the problem that you, that you want to solve? So the testing pro part is where you actually go there and say, okay, let's do, let's, let's compare, let's try this against like not having this. Is it better to have this thing that I built than not having it at all? Or, or maybe let's test this thing against the previous thing that they already have, which I'm trying to improve. Did I actually improve it or not? So this, this phase is very important and it actually pro provides the actual empirical results that you would need in order to say that, well, you know, I performed research. But uh, at the same time, it's complicated because sometimes you don't. So I, what I wanted to say here is that in order to have a complete scientific or research project, you should have the test and you should plan for it and you should take it seriously because or else it may get forgotten. And, and that will for sure have an impact on how your thesis is evaluated. And anyway, our focus is in this thing. Yeah, now I'm gonna give you like some, a very, very quick example of what it means, what it means all these things that I'm talking about in terms of actual research, right? So uh, this, this example comes from a paper, an, a scientific paper that was published in this, uh, in this conference called CHI in 2010, so it's 10 years ago, but it's, as an example, it still works. It's not, uh, it's fairly recent actually. And um, so, so this conference is the best conference in the world where all the best research is published regarding human computer interaction, which is this big area that encompasses everything that is related to humans, how humans interact with computers in general. It could be software, it could be hardware, it could be anything, it's all in there. And it's the, the number one. So this is good research that I'm giving you as an example. Uh, and it's called example-centric programming, integrating web search into the development environment, right? So let's go through it to see if we understand how this research was performed and how it fits into the model that we have defined so far, right? So empathizing. First of all, let's understand what's the context of our user. The availability of online source code examples has fundamentally changed programming practices. So basically the authors are saying, you know, the fact that you can find examples of source code online everywhere for virtually every problem that ever existed, that has fundamentally changed programming practice because nowadays people are not just programming alone the computer, they're, they're actually tapping into this huge knowledge that's available online, right? So that changed, that changed programming. So this is the context of our user. And then the, the definition of the pro problem, and this is all extracted directly from the paper, okay? Definition of the problem. However, current search tools are not designed to assist with programming tasks and are wholly separate from editing tools. Now, real, uh, you can see here how this is a definition of a problem, but there is absolutely no mentioning of how to fix it, right? So the problem basically is that you have Google and you have your code editor, whatever it is, right? But if, if you're coding in your editor and you need to search for something, a code example, for example, then you have to move away from the, from the editor 
open Google and then search for something or Stack Overflow, or whatever you're doing. So these two things are separate. And in the, in the minds of the, the author, this is a problem because it would be better if they were somehow integrated. I don't know how to integrate this, but there is a problem and the problem is that they're not integrated. Then, then comes the idea. The idea of the authors is embedding a test specific search engine in the development environment can significantly reduce the cost of finding information and thus enable programmers to write better code more easily. So then comes the idea of how to solve this problem. I'm gonna take a search engine, like a code search engine, and I'm gonna put it inside a code editor or an IDE or whatever. And this is my idea. I want to integrate these two things. And I, my idea is that if I do this, then I will improve the performance of my code, right? Of not my code, but the coders in general, programming in general. Then comes the next one, the prototype. Then they built this thing called Blueprint, uh, which is a, a one impossible implementation of the idea of integrating the task search, the task specific engine into the IDE. Blueprint is a web search interface integrated into the Adobe Flex Builder development environment that helps users locate example code, automatically augments queries with code context. So if you, you wanna search something, you, just, you, you can search by, by something that you, some code that you've already written, presents a code-centric view of search results and embeds the search experience into the, the editor. So this is what they built. They built this prototype in order to kind of like use it, use it as a proof of concept of the idea that came before. Now, notes, notice that, for example, this is integrated into the Adobe Flex Builder development environment. This is just one possibility, right? This could be into visual code. I don't think they had visual code at that point, but it could be integrated into visual code. Uh, visual, is it visual, uh, Microsoft Visual Studio Code, whatever. Uh, it could be in Atom, it could be in anything, right? But in this specific one, they did it in Adobe Flex Builder because they, they, they had to build the product, right? And then they actually tested it afterwards. So they actually did two tests. One was a comparative laboratory study, which found that Blueprint enables participants to write significantly better code and find example code significantly faster than with a standard web browser. The second one was an analysis of three months of usage logs. So they let people use it during three months openly. And then they analyzed it, 2,024 users. And that suggests that task specific search interfaces can significantly change how and when people search the web. Now, it's very important here to, to understand that in order to publish this paper, the test here was absolutely mandatory, right? So it's not, sometimes you don't see it in thesis, but in order to publish a paper like this, you have to have that. And, and the results must be very compelling. So they had to do this and in a, in a very correct way. So it, it made no, it really made no difference, or let's say for the audience of this research paper, it doesn't really matter that you actually built something super cool, right? Which is something that we do a lot, a lot. We, we build something and then we stop there. But for, for the audience, for the, let's say the researchers that were interested in reading this paper, the fact that you go all the way to building something doesn't really matter at all. Because if you cannot have compelling results with uh, done in the right way to show that you tested it and it actually works, then for a researcher, that doesn't really matter too much. So in this case, it's uh, very important. They, they did these things and we're gonna come back to this in order to analyze what kind of, of tests they ran and why are they interesting and valid and they, they were done in the correct way, right? For now, I just wanted to give you an overview of what was done. The first takeaway that I want you guys to, to think about, uh, so this is like first takeaway of the lecture, the method is more important than the results. Okay, we're gonna discuss this in details, but I want, this is kind of like a catchphrase that I want you guys to, to keep in mind all the time when you're doing whatever it is you're doing with research methods. The method is more important than the results, okay? That means that if you do your research the correct way, with the right method, 
And then in the end, you realize that, well, you know what, actually the results didn't show anything interesting. That's absolutely no problem, zero problem about that. Because what the methods, if you do something with the correct method, what happens is that you have gathered significant and interesting information about the world, whatever it is that you were doing. And the way that you gathered it is interesting and significant. So, the, so if, if, if the method is, is correct and valid, then the results are valid. And if your results don't show anything, that's okay because that's also knowledge about the world. You, you've tried to do something and it didn't work. So, so what? So then the, the next person will not have to try that. They can benefit from your experience in knowing that that specific hypothesis that you have or that specific idea that you have didn't work. No problem, as long as the method is correct, right? So research methods or how to test in our case, right? I mean, like I said, you could consider that the whole thing is a research project and everything could have methods involved in them. But in our case, we're, we're thinking about how to test quantitatively. A good research method is reproducible. So what does it mean to be reproducible? Everything that you do, everything must be open and must be something that someone else can do it again. If not, then it's not valid uh, scientific knowledge. Every scientific knowledge must be able to be reproduced because people might want to check and might want to do another experiment like what you did in order to make sure that your results will hold. That's a very important part of, of science. If you just say, ah, I did something uh, last week and, and this is what I have, this is my results. And people are like, oh, but how can I know if, if you did it right? How, how do I know if this is actually truth? How do I know that your results actually came from what you're saying that, that it came? Maybe you're, maybe you're faking it, who knows? So I want to, I want to take the, the methods and I want to do it again just to make sure that I'll get the same results as you do. And that must be reproducible must be auditable, it's related to being reproducible, but it must be, it must be presented or, or it must be, yeah, it must be presented in a way that it's possible for someone to audit the process and, and actually say, you know, whether you did it right or not by, by, by let's say, uh, digging through your methods, right? Uh, again, very important part of science. Transparency. Transparency is just a one like big like general word for for everything else that we're talking about, and it must be well grounded in previous research. What does it mean? It means that you must every time you do any research, you must some you must somehow connect it to something that came before it. I mean, unless for some crazy reason you're doing something that is so completely novel and so different that nobody else ever did anything like that or even related, which is usually not the case, right? Uh, unless you're some kind of like a completely outlier genius or something like this, then, but most uh, other cases will be well grounded in previous research. So you have to know what people did before you in order to make sure that, you know, what you're doing actually makes sense. And also the method itself must be grounded in previous research because you cannot just come up with the method and say, you know what, I follow this method. So your method is reproducible, is auditable, is transparent, but you invented it, let's say. I invented this crazy method and it, this is how it is. Well, but in that case, it's complicated because how can we actually know if the method that you invented actually works, right? So it's not, it makes, it's, it's not uh, enough to be just reproducible and notable, but it also be something that it has some kind of a protocol, right? So it must be well grounded in previous research. And different areas have different research methods. And, and that's why I say it's a previous research, because if you're a researcher in media technology, or if you're a researcher in machine learning, then your, your specific uh, community, so to speak, will have different protocols and different uh, ideas of what it means to do research in that area. And although they, you don't have to follow it always 100%, you have to have some reason for, for what you're doing. If you're changing, then you have to have a good reason for changing anyway. And, and uh, the validity and trustworthiness of the research results relies in the quality of the research method. So results are only valid if the method is valid. One thing goes directly from the other. Research results are valid when 
the method is valid. Research results are trustworthy, so you can trust them if the method is trustworthy, if you trust the method. Or else, someone can just say, I went <clears throat> last week somewhere and did this and that, and that's what I got. It's like, how, why would you trust that, right? You, you shouldn't, actually. So, so it's very important that to remember the validity of the results is everything, the quality, so to speak, of the results is directly tied to the quality of the method. Now, that said, there is no absolute truth. Uh, what does that mean? When you actually ask a research question and, and then you want to use, you will use some research method to answer that question, your answer is never the absolute truth about what you're research, right? So it's, even if your results are great, amazing, and you did everything right, science or research never gives an absolute truth. You can gather evidence that points towards something. You can gather evidence that either points towards confirming something that is already known, which is Oh, great, the, the more you confirm something that's already known, the, the better, you know, the more we know about that. Or you could gather evidence that points to rejecting something that, that is already known. So maybe there is a theory, but your data is pointing in another direction. So maybe that theory is wrong based on the, the new data that you gathered. In both ways, you can never assume, well, Let's say never, but you can you can almost never assume that something is completely right either way. Either way. Actually, I, th I think I could say never. You can never assume that something is completely right because no research is perfect, and there is simply no absolute truth. Some uh, some some propositions propositions are always open to being contested, right? Um, so a research question can be answered in different ways. The same research question could be answered in different ways using different methods, right? For example, this thing that we call a sample study or a one sample study is you estimate one un unknown value by measuring a sample. So you go out there, you gather some data, then from that data, you estimate a certain thing. So you gather 100 data points about something and then from those 100 data points using the correct quantitative method, you extract a certain uh, knowledge about that by estimating a value. That's one way to answer a question. And then of course you have to, to know how to present that and, and how exactly to, to extract those values, but it's one way. However, you could also have like observe, observational studies to, to answer the same thing. So you could estimate the correlation between two variables by taking a sample from the population and measuring it. So you, instead of going out there and measuring one thing, you could go out there and measure two things at the same time. And then later you could try to determine whether these two things that you measured at the same time are actually correlated or if not, or if they're completely independent from each other. Because maybe you have a, a certain hypothesis that says, well, this thing is correlated with that thing. And then you measure that and then you find out that that's not true. Who knows? Uh, that's also a way to, to answer a certain question. Controlled experiments are also a way to answer uh, research questions They're much more uh, let's say advanced way. Uh, so you estimate the causality between two variables. It's different than correlation. So make sure you remember that correlation and causality are two different things. We're gonna discuss that later, but make sure you remember that. An observational study measures correlation. A controlled experiment can measure causality, which is a much more interesting thing, but can only be measured in a correct controlled experiment. So what is causality? What is the difference between causality and correlation? Well, when two things are correlated, you don't know if one thing causes the other. All you know is that they are correlated somehow. Maybe A causes B, maybe P, B causes A, or maybe no, none of them cause each other and they're caused by something else. But, uh, but when you estimate the causality, then you're actually saying, look, A causes B. Okay, that's much more, much stronger like link between A and B. Uh, and you have to do it in, in a control experiment is the right way to do it. And you split your population in two parts. Then you control something, you change something in one of them, and then you measure them. And that's what estimates the causality. We're going to come back to this. 
Um, but we, and or, or maybe you want to do a mix of, of them. So maybe you think that you need two different perspectives. So maybe you do a sample study and a controlled experiment or something like this. You can also mix them depending on your research question. Uh, or you can do something else like a structured interview survey. We're not going to go into that. Uh, you can read about that in the book. That's more like qualitative stuff. And we're not going to touch on that in this, in this lectures. And I think Kali will, will maybe talk to you a little bit about that. I think so. I'm not sure. Yeah. And this is, this is like an overview of these three things, right? I, I, I took this from Khan Academy. They are, the, the, their course on statistics and probability is absolutely amazing. So in, in case you guys are interested in going beyond the lecture, um, take a look at this course on, from Khan Academy of Non-Statistics and Probability because it's really good. Um, I, used this at a, I used it as a refresher some time ago uh, and it's it really, I mean, this guy is amazing. When, and the, the way that he explains things is just incredible. Uh, so basically, yeah, we have these, these, these three, three possible like sample study, observational study and experiment. They kind of, they are more, they are progressively, let's say more advanced from left to right. Uh, they give progressively more information about the, whatever it is that you're doing the research on, but they are also progressively harder, right, to do. A uh, controlled experiment, for example, you, ac you, you actually have to mess with things. You have, you have to go there and and change things. So it's not something you can do all the time. While observational studies is kind of yeah, a little bit easier, but still a little bit harder than sample study. Not much actually, but a little bit. And basically just in general, that's what they mean, right? So in the sample study, you are, you are taking a sample from a certain population and then measuring it, and then trying to, to understand the population by looking at the sample. We're going to talk a little bit more about this this difference between uh, population and sample. On an observational study, you do the same thing, but you measure two things at the same time instead of measuring just one, and then you compare them somehow, right? Like for example, here, in this case, uh, so for, yeah, for for example, in this case with the sample study, they are measuring average daily time on computer. So you have a population of all the people that use computers. Then you take this a sample and you measure the average daily time on a computer that a, that a person spends. And then you try to understand the population by looking at the sample. In the observational study, you do the same thing. You still take a sample from a population. But then for example, in this case, they measured computer time versus blood pressure. So measure the computer time, measure blood pressure. And then let's see if they are related somehow. For example, in this case, in this plot here, you can see that they are actually correlated, apparently, but it's quite clear that they are correlated. Um, and, but the most important part here in the observation study is that we cannot define causality. And then the experiment. Uh, since I'm gonna go, come back to this later, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna spend too much time here and I'm gonna keep on moving, but if you have questions, please let me know and I'll try to answer them. But there's, this, this is something that we're gonna come back a couple of times more in order to have a more, more clear understanding here, okay? So just remember that for an experiment, it's not enough to just measure. You have to actually split people into two groups, measure them separately while one is controlled and the other is not. And then later you will compare things, but the, the, the outcomes or the conclusions are different than what you get from an observational study. So if you go back to our example, in light of these three um, possible ways of, of doing research, doing quantitative research, then we see that they did actually two of them. First of all, they did a compar comparative laboratory study, which is, an ex which is another word for an, for an actual experiment. And why is it an experiment? Because they actually did it in a controlled environment. They took a few people, like a group of people, they put them in a computer and said, do this. Then they took another group of people and they said, also do this, the same thing, but using our tool. So this first group, like do a certain thing, but no tool, no nothing. Just, just use whatever, like Google, whatever it is that you use. This other group is say, okay, you're gonna do the same thing, but you're going to use our tool, right? 
And if the control, if the control experiment is, is planned correctly or designed correctly, then we measure these two things. And if the group with the new tool had better measurements than the other one, whatever it is that you're measuring, you could measure many things, then you can actually say, look, our tool actually caused an improvement in uh, search time or in, in, in programming quality or whatever it is that, you're me that they're measuring, right? But if, they, if it's an experiment, then you have to do this split. And then they did an analysis of three months of usage logs. This analysis of three months of usage logs, this is not an experiment because this is done, let's say, in the wild. They just gave it to people and say, whatever, do it. So this is not controlled. This is not something that's happening in the lab and you're not controlling anything. You're just letting people do it. Then you're gathering data about that and then you analyze that data. So that's just an observational study. And whether it's a, uh, a sample study or, or an observational study depends on whether on how many things they, they uh, measured and how they analyzed it. So I guess that they measured more than just one thing. They mo measured probably many things, right? And then they probably analyze those, those things together. So I'm guessing it's an observation study. I don't remember now exactly. But um, it doesn't matter because what matters is that it's done in the wild, then it's observed. And then later they, they will take that data and extrapolate and try to understand, extract uh, information about it. So correlations, uh, values of, of factors of the population and so on. Uh, so that's observational, okay? Maybe one sampler, maybe two samples or maybe more than two samples. So yeah, so th this is, this is uh, wh where I wanted to, to get here is that, okay, research methods are more important than anything else. So if you have good method, you have good results, period. Even if your results are completely different than what you expected. Doesn't matter at all. Second takeaway of, uh, of the lecture that we're gonna discuss now is that quantitative research is actually intuitive and maybe even fun. Uh, this is just me saying, <laughs> because I think that it is. Uh, but the truth is that, uh, or maybe the, the fun part, the intuitive part, I guess it's, uh, I, can, I can demonstrate it to you, but not the fun. <laughs> I think it's fun, I hope you think so too. <laughs> but it is intuitive, and when I say that is intuitive, what I mean is that if you keep it simple, if you don't go too far, like if you don't stray away from, from the simple, the basic things that you can do and that actually give you good results, then you don't need to, to make it complicated. You can, make it, you can do something very, in, a, in a very simple way and you can get good results by doing it in a very simple way. As long as you are absolutely sure that the methods are correct, you're doing them correctly. So if they're simple and intuitive, it's even better than if you just try to do something super complicated and then you don't have a, a clear objective concrete result, okay? So it is intuitive and it makes sense and I will try to, to demonstrate that to you and I, I'll try to communicate that to you, hopefully I can. So far so good guys, do you, do you have any questions? Do you wanna ask me something on chat or audio or anything? Just please. You're welcome to interrupt me at any time whatsoever, okay? At all. Sorry, uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Adam here, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was wondering if, yeah. uh, I read in the book that it says like, you should uh, define your question or sort of like before you choose your method. Yeah. But, it, um, but uh, Hearing you talk about it, it seems like very nice to have defined the method before because it seems like uh, it defines like the outcome of the project, maybe or the research stuff. But no, 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 because the the method it the method comes directly from the question because the okay. method is a way to answer your question. So if you don't have a question, then you don't have a method. Because okay. Because the method, like for example, and when we're talking about, let's say uh, the difference between a controlled experiment and, uh, and uh, an observational study, right? So oh. for example, let's say in an, some, some more, a more general example, let's say uh, you're testing if a new drug is effective, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you can't simply, well, 
let's say, let's say you, the, the, the research question that you have, the first thing that you have is your research question. So you say, I want to, I want to de determine, this is not a correct research question, but we're going to come back to this later. But anyway, I want to determine whether this new meth, this new drug actually, uh, you know, helps people get better from a certain disease, right? Yeah. So y your question is, if the use of the, the drug causes uh, an improvement in the health condition of a person. Mm. So if, you, if your research question is saying that this thing causes that thing, then you must do an experiment. So your research okay. question has determined which method you want to use. Because on another hand, you could say something like, I want to, I want to investigate whether age is related to uh, average time, a daily time on a computer. So I'm not saying that I want to, to determine whether age causes a different uh, average daily time on a computer. I want to, to mm. determine if they are related so in that, that case, I don't need an experiment. And I wouldn't be able to do an experiment about this anyway, but uh, I don't need an experiment because all I need is to, uh, to gather some data, measure two things, and then check if they are correlated. Mm. So, so, so it doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm 12 years old. I, I love to hang on the computer. Like that is not the causation, but there may be a correlation. Yeah, exactly. So it's not because you're 12, year old, 12 years old that you like to be on a computer. Yeah. Like, I mean, or, or we cannot determine that. It's not like, okay, the age of the person causes the person to be more time on the computer. <laughs> they, are, they are related somehow in a very complex way that we have no idea about, right? So I don't know why a 12-year-old likes to be on the computer more than a 30-year-old. And actually, is that even true? I don't know, because I, I work in, on a computer eight hours a day, so maybe, I don't know, maybe probably I, I, I'm the computer more than a, than a child. But uh, what I mean is that, we can find a relationship between these, these values, but we cannot say that the age causes the, the person to stay in the computer. And of course, we cannot say that the, a person staying in the computer causes them to be a certain age. That's even more ridiculous. So, um, so you see how you have a question and then that question determines what, ha what method you have to use in order to answer that. So the, the question always comes first, always. Okay. But of course, you, you, need, you. you need to know the methods because you cannot just ask something completely crazy that is impossible to answer. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. so of course, of course, it's kind of like you kind of know which method you're going to use even before you, you actually establish your research question. Because, I mean, you know it. Well, you, that's how it is, right? Mm. But, uh, but, but one thing is, is tightly connected to the other. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. So please, everyone, feel free to interrupt me at any time. It's totally fine, okay? Quantitative research then involves answering statistical questions by gathering and analyzing evidence in the form of data. Um, so there are two important things here, statistical questions and data. And the, the important thing about statistical questions is that not every question is a, a relevant statistical question. Because a relevant statistical question, like the right statistical question, has to be related to something that can be measured objectively. So um, I cannot ask some good, weird statistical question about love or I don't know, uh, sadness or something like this, because that's uh, very, it's, it's hard to measure objectively. Um, or how, how is it that someone feels about something? And I mean, unless you can actually d determine some categories of feelings or anything like that. Um, and that, it also must be one that involves analyzing data with variability. And that's also very important, which is not, uh, we, we don't always think about that, but that's very important because sometimes the question simply doesn't have enough variability to, to even be relevant. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit, but if you cannot clear, clearly identify these two aspects in your research question, hypothesis, idea, whatever, then probably you would have to rethink this, your, your strategy or your question. Let's go over that a little bit, especially with the question of variability, because the question of can it, if it can be measured objectively or not, I think it's more or less straightforward because we have 
like we okay we're saying that we're gonna measure numbers right so i expect that you guys think about this when you're coming up with your research question and then it has to involve some measurement of numbers but uh the question of variability is a little bit less um clear so for example if i if i go let's say i go to uh, the city center and i stop random people on the street and I say hey how many pet lions uh do you have right I mean, if you do this on America, I mean, this is a result of an American uh, survey, but if we do it uh, in Sweden, it's probably even worse. Uh, I guess it will be much worse, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I'm guessing at least some people have lions in the United States for whatever reason. So uh, how many pet lions do Americans own? That's, that's a question you could ask, right? But the truth is that it's probably going to be like almost zero. Not zero because some people have lions. But if you consider that there are what, like 300 million people in the United States or more, I don't remember now, um, that, that number will be so low, so low, so low that it simply makes no sense to do such a research. You know, if you wanna know who has a pet lion and probably you're better off just checking the records of, you know, the whatever association keeps records about that probably not the American Pet Products Association, some, some kind of like wildlife association or whatever. They probably have a register of people who have lions and then you can just check that because it's probably like some people, right? So there is no variability in there. While if you ask how many pets in general do Americans own, that has a lot of variability because that could be so, so many different things. Fish, cats, dogs, birds, whatever, horses, as, as we can see here in the table. So it, that, that's the kind of question that you can expect when you, when you gather data about that. You can expect that it will change, right? Uh, and, and also it is complex enough that you don't have an obvious answer to that. So I don't know uh, if people have more fishes than cats or more cats than dogs, that, that's not obvious, right? And, and even if, if, if I assume that there are more cats than dogs, how much more? Is it like double the amount of cats than dogs or it's not that much? Again, we can see the data here in the, in the table, but what I'm, I'm thinking just like before that, even if I didn't know that, you know, I wouldn't be able to obviously just, just derive that result. So, so that's the kind of thing that actually makes sense to, to, to do research on. Things that are, not obvious because they they have some variability to it right um and and with statistics we measure and analyze this kind of variability this is what statistics is about is to to analyze data that actually varies somehow so this variability this variation the, the profile of this variation how it happens that's what statistics is about so if you don't have that then you don't have a statistical question right um, and, and anyway, this, we analyze that in order to comprehend a certain phenomenon and we're going to talk about that. So for example, the total number of pets owned in the United States is, I mean, there's a lot more fish, for example, than cat based on this specific, uh, survey, right? So there's much more freshwater fish than cats and a little bit more cats than dogs. And then a lot more than birds are this, the fourth one, but by a long margin, right? Uh, so this is kind of like, this is, this is non-obvious information that makes sense to, for you to actually go out there and do like a survey or something. I don't even know if this is actually like, I, I can't really say if this was statistically like a, a survey or they actually checked some records or something. So maybe, if they, maybe, they, they, maybe this was not a research per se, but what matters is that the data is variable enough that you could do a research based on, on something like this. So this, here I have uh, some, some examples of statistical and non-statistical questions, and I'm gonna go very quickly over them. And if you have any, any doubts about any of these, please either uh, interrupt me or raise your hand on, on Zoom that I, and I will uh, keep checking here to see if anyone has, has a problem. So for example, how old is the prime minister of Sweden? That's obviously not a statistical question, right? There is one data point, which is one <laughs> prime minister of Sweden. Then you ask him, how old are you? I'm whatever, 89. And then you say, okay, that's it. There, that's not a statistical question, right? 
Uh, on the other hand, how old are you who are attending this lecture, right? Right now I have nine people on Zoom, but I know that there are more with Nadia. So that would be an interesting statistical question because there is variability in this data. You have, the, uh, of course, there's not a wild margin of variability. So I, I expect it's gonna be like 20 something most of the time and maybe some 30 somethings, but I guess most of you are 20 something. Uh, so that doesn't vary like s greatly, but it does vary. Some of you are 25, some of you are 28, some of you are 31. And, and, and that's, you know, um, there is some variability there and, and, and it's not obvious. Like I know that there is a certain range, but it's not obvious exactly how old you are, everyone, and how, what's the profile of ages, everything. I mean, I don't know that for sure. So that is a, an interesting statistical questions, right? question, right? Do dogs run faster than cats? That's a good statistical question because I'm, I'm asking a very general question. Do dogs in general run faster than cats in general? That's a very, that's, there's a lot of variability. I expect that some dogs run faster than other dogs. Some dogs run faster than some cats. Some cats, cats maybe run faster than some dogs because there is a wide range also in dogs and cats in general. So somehow, if I wanted to determine this, I would have to do some kind of a very complicated research with, with some very advanced method because it's a very open question, but it's still a very an interesting statistical question. How can I help a blind person browse the internet in a better way? That's not a statistical question, although that could be your research question, but that wouldn't be the kind of uh, statistical question that you ask that you get their numbers about, right? How can I help a blind person browse the internet? You, you might, for example, take a look at all kinds of, um, of possible assist, assistive technologies out there for blind people, and then you could make a, a report about that. Well, there's this, there's that, and there's that. But there's not a, that's not a statistical question that where you get their numbers, and then you say this or that, X or Y, right? There's no number that answer these questions. Uh, does your cat Mike weigh more than your dog Julius? That's not a st statistical question. You take the weight of your cat, you take the weight of your dog, you compare them, you have a number, that's it. That's not statistical, it's just one number. It's the same thing as asking how old is the prime minister of Sweden. Does it rain more in Stockholm than Vecchio? This is, this is an interesting statistical question. Does it rain more? The answer to this is yes or no. And that, although that's not a number, we can still assume that that's the statistical question because in order to determine that, you have to measure somehow how much it rains in Stockholm, somehow how much it rains in Vecchio, and those are objective measurements. And then somehow you have to compare them, the numbers. And then if the number in Stockholm is more than Vecchio, then you say, yes, it does rain more in Stockholm than Vecchio. So, uh, but the, the whole process of gathering the data and comparing is a statistical, is, is, is really like a quantitative research. And so it is a statistical question because there's a lot of variability in how much it rains in Stockholm and Vecco in different years, in different months and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of variability in the data. Did it rain more in Stockholm than Vecco in 2013 in total? This is a little bit trickier, but I would say that this is not a statistical question. And the reason is, the, is that you can take one number for how much it rained in Stockholm in 2013. There's a certain measurement, one measurement. Then you have one, measure in, one measurement that says how much it measured in, it, it rained in Vecchio. Then you compare them and you have one value. That's it, that's not statistical. But of course, one could say, well, you know, it's hard to determine how much it rained in Stockholm in 2013. So by itself, that is statistical because you could measure how much it rained per day, for example. And there's a lot of variability how much it rained per day. And then in order to determine that, you would have to somehow gather this data and then come up with like how much it rained in Stockholm, period. Uh, that would be a statistical question in that sense. So this is a little bit like ambiguous, but if you just consider that there is one value for Stockholm and one value for Vecchio, and then you compare them, then no, that's not a statistical question. Do computer science professors make more money than, than programmers? That is a statistical question. You will have to call a bunch of computer science professors that, and ask them how much 
what's your salary? That will vary a lot because different professors make different well, money. Then you would have to call a lot of programmers and ask them how much money do you get? That varies probably even more than the professors. So there's a lot of variability in both cases. And then somehow you would have to get this and then compare this. So that's, the, yeah, that is a very interesting statistical question with a lot of variability in the data and a non-obvious uh, answer, right? Is that clear? Uh, it's very important for you guys to, to know what's, what's, what are statistical and non-statistical questions because you, that, if you come up with non-statistical questions, then of course, it's not gonna work for the, for the data getting. Uh, sorry, but uh, I didn't quite understand like the difference between the second question and uh, that does it rain more in Stockholm than Lekwa. Would it Shouldn't it be like a yes or no question for the last one also? Yeah, um, you're right. The thing is, uh, the answer to your question is yes or no. Uh, but the, the, the data that you're going to gather for answering the question uh, has to be statistical, has to be variable. So, but just which, which one exactly are you mentioning? Please conf uh, confirm to me. Uh, does it rain more in Stockholm than Vecra? Yeah. And uh, do computer science professors make more money than programmers? Yeah, they are both statistical questions and they are basically the same in okay. a way. Because oh. both of them, in both of them, you have to take two groups, you have to measure them in, in different ways, right? So, uh, and, and both of them will have variability. And so that both of them are uh, statistical questions. I think you're, well, you're, the one you're asking is actually, did it rain more in Stockholm than Vecro in 2013? Mm, okay. Because did it rain more in Stockholm than oh. Vecro in 2013? Mm. That is not a statistical question. Again, if you consider that there is one value for how much it rained in Stockholm in 2013 and mm. one value for how much it rained in Vecco in 2013. Oh, okay. Because you, got, you have the total that you yeah. get it from. Okay. For oh, example, sorry. like I have, yeah. let's say I have somehow I have stored like it rained a total of X in Stockholm in 2013 and it rained a total of Y in Vecco in 2013. See, if you have that, then that's not mm. a statistical question. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, great. Thank right. you. But of course, you could, like I said, you could frame it as, as a statistical question. If you say, I don't know how much it rained in Stockholm total. So I have to somehow measure different days and different weeks or something. And then it, it mm -hmm. may, it might become a, a, a statistical question in that case. Oh, okay. No. Okay. Nice. Right. Cool. Okay. Then I, I got it. Yeah. Uh, my brain turned much there. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, what is data for us, right? Data is a very open uh, abstract concept that could be interpreted in millions of different ways. But for us, data is objective measurements of a certain phenomenon of interest, which can be of different types, right? So for example, categorical data, measurements belong to a specific set of values. So for example, which program you belong to, like you can be in media technology or you can be in computer science or you can be in something else. That's a categorical value. That's just some, some value that says where you are. It's not a number or, in, or I mean, no, courses have numbers, not programs, right? So anyway, it doesn't matter because uh, it's just really just a name of something, right? Are you married or single or sambo or something like that? That's also like a categorical value. Then there is ordinal values, which is, are similar to categorical, but they have an intrinsic order. So you know that something goes after the other. Like for example, grades, A, B, C, D, E. They're categorical because they have like an, a name to A, B, C, but, you, but they have an order. You know that A is better than B and B is better than C and C is better than, than D and so on and so forth, right? So they're not categorical anymore, they're ordinal. Then you have discrete values, which are numerical measurements, but are limited to whole numbers. So age, for example, in years, I'm 28 or I'm 29. I mean, of course you could say I'm 28.2, but that would be kind of weird, right? Like what is 28.2? kind of strange. 
Uh, also, you could say something like, how many pets do you have? That's also a discrete value because it's, I, am, I have one pet or two or three or zero. I don't have two pets and a half, right? That doesn't make sense. Um, and then there's continuous, which are actual numerical measurements in general with fractional parts, right? So I can say like, for example, the time it takes to perform a task in seconds. Again, of course, it's not 2.5 seconds, although you could say 2.5 seconds, that wouldn't be so weird, but you would say like two seconds and 100 milliseconds or something like this. But still, it's continuous because it has, it has like a lot of stuff in between one second and two seconds, right? Depending on how, how fine grained is your measurement. And it could be something else, whatever, like uh, what's your salary? You know, it could be 10,000 crowns and 50 cents or something like this, right? So, um, they can have fractional parts. And it could be other stuff also, temperature and so on and so forth. This is usually the focus of this course. Although it, it's not a disaster if you want to measure discrete things. This it cannot be categorical, it cannot be ordinal, but in your, in your proposal. But if you want to do something that's discrete, it's also not a, a disaster as long as there's a lot of variability and, and a wide range of values to take from. See, if you want to measure something that's discrete but only has like four or five different possible uh, values, then I'm not sure it's going to work. So, so we, we can talk about that later. But usually, most of the time, we're going to focus on continuous measurements, which is the most complicated but also the most interesting. So for example, let's, let's say I went out and I gathered a certain set of measurements for whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, so one, one set of measurements, okay? I just went and gathered some data about something. Uh, bivariate cases and multivariate cases, which is when you go out and you measure two things at the same time or four things or more than that, uh, are, no, multivariate are beyond our scope. B, bivariate cases, we're going to talk a little bit about that also. When you go out there and you measure two things at the same time. But more than that is beyond the scope of the course for now. Okay, Multiple measurements is too much. So we are going to most of the time talk about one set, but also a little bit about two, two measurements at the same time. So for example, I went there and I gathered this data 1.13, 0 0.551, so on and so forth. This is one way that you can look at this data here because when you just look at the numbers like, well, I mean, what, what, whatever. I, I have no idea what that, what's that thing, right? I don't understand. I don't see any patterns in it. But when you actually plot a histogram like this, uh, you, can, you can have a picture of the data distribution. There are millions of ways for you to generate such a histogram. Uh, and you could generate different histograms from the same data. Let's just, uh, let's say, uh, take a look at this and, and, and kind of understand what it means. Basically what, what this histogram is saying is this, there, there is one data point in the range between minus two and minus one point something here, which is a bit uh, like one, probably 1 1.25, I guess. So uh, something like that, 1.25 or 1.3. Then there are three data points in this range here between one, minus 1 1.3 and minus 0 0.4 or something like this, I don't know exactly. Then there are four data points in this range and four data points in this other range and two data points in this other range. So what this, what this kind of show, is showing you is density. What is the density of points in each specific um, range, or we call them buckets sometimes. So we consider that there are like five buckets and then you put the numbers in there and then you count how many numbers are in each bucket. So that gives you an idea of the density in each of these uh, buckets or in each of these ranges of values, right? We're gonna come back to this about visualization in general and, and simple things that you can do in order to, you know, analyze your data and so on. That will come later. Uh, right now, it doesn't really matter too much and I don't have that much time, so I will just uh, uh, skip forward a little bit. Uh, and, and I just wanted to show you that thing, that specific thing, just so that you understood that when you go out there and you, and you gather some data, just by generating a histogram like this, using the same technique that we used here, you might see something like this. And, and the cool thing about this is, is that 
depending on what you see, if it fits into a certain kind of like pre, uh, previously known template of data distribution, then it's cool because you, you, you can fit it into the stuff that we know already about those kinds of, of distributions. So for example, if you have a distribution that is like this, symmetric, unimodal and bell-shaped like this, goes like this and there's a peak here, then you know that this is what is called like a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. And there's a lot of stuff that we know about Gaussian distributions. Uh, we basically know perfectly how they work. So if you're measuring and you find a normal distribution like this, and basically you can reuse all kinds of knowledge that we have about normal distributions in general in order to understand your data. And it's the same for those that are skewed to the right or skewed to the left, or they have two different peaks like this or like this. This is also something that we can reason about because they, they look familiar and they look like stuff that we already know about. And then we can take a lot of conclusions about this. But just in general, you don't have to worry about that right now. It's just I wanted to, to make sure that you understand that when you gather the data and, and then you look at it, you may find familiar patterns. And if you do, then that's good. Um, but one, one important thing is that uh, when you look at the distribution like this, it's nice that you can look at the distribution, like make a histogram like this, look at the distribution, say, wow, cool, it looks interesting. But the truth is that when you're actually doing research, you need more objective ways to describe and compare distributions, right? Now, I just wanna make sure that uh, I'm gonna give a very quick uh, overview of this because uh, we're gonna come back to this. There's, I think next week, if I'm not mistaken, is specifically about like measurements and things like that. So you don't have to really worry too much about this right now. Just, just so we just have to remember right? That looking at a distribution like this is not enough to do uh, research. Um, but yeah, basically here, what matters is that looking at the distribution only like this and then uh, gathering some information about the shape of the distribution is not enough. When you're doing research, you actually have to extract objective, concrete data about what your, well, concrete conclusions about the data that you get, right? So con concrete values, something that gives you a profile of your distribution, uh, but not, not in a visual way, in an actual concrete objective measure, right? So the mean, also known as average, is the most common descriptive statistic of a distribution. So when you take the mean of a distribution, basically you're saying, okay, I gathered a bunch of data, this is the mean. And this says something about your data. Like for example, I've gathered, let's take an example of the previous slide. I've gathered the salaries of uh, 30 different computer science professors. This is the mean. The mean salary of a computer science professor is, I don't know, 32,000 uh, Swiss crowns or something, right? That says something about your distribution. You extracted that from your distribution. So that is a, a measurement that summarizes your data, right? It's usually called a um, descriptive statistic because it describes your data in one number, even though you gathered 30 of them. Of course, you can still plot the distribution and show the distribution that gives also another information. Like for example, if you look down here, you can see the population distribution, then you see something and then you, you see where the actual uh, mean is. So you have both things at the same time, but, but you usually, for an actual objective, concrete research, you will get the mean and say, okay, I will do something with this mean or the mean is my conclusion or something like this. So uh, it's, it's the descriptive statistic, describes your data set. You can also uh, think of it as a statistical summary. So it's a, it's a summary of your data as a whole using just one number, right? If you need to describe your data distribution with only one value, even though that's never, obviously never accurate, but if you do have, then probably the mean is that, the value that you're gonna use, okay? And then there's the standard deviation also, because even though the mean is indeed quite descriptive, it is often not enough, because 
even though you can't, you, you, sorry, you know the mean, but different distributions can have the same mean. Uh, and, and the mean doesn't tell you how, how spread that distribution is. And that's what the standard deviation will give you, the, the spread of the data distribution, okay? Now, like I said, I'm going quickly on this because we're gonna go back, come back to these specific things. Uh, but just remember these two things, mean and standard deviation. These are two things, probably the two main values that you're gonna extract from any kind of data that you gather. And you're, you'll understand why I'm talking about this right now because I need to, to touch on it later. So in summary, let's summarize this first uh, few things that we have seen, seen so far. In summary, when you come up with your research question for a quantitative study, you have to think about whether you can answer your question by collecting objective data and if the data has variability. If it doesn't, then that's a problem. You have to rethink your research question. And some examples of interesting statistical questions when you're doing media technology research. So how good or how fast are users when performing a certain task in my application? Is there a relationship between a given factor and their performance? So maybe there's, there's a specific characteristic of your, of your application that you think affects performance. So maybe you could have two different versions, one with that characteristic and one without that characteristic. And then you wanna maybe test them both and compare if, if your assumption is correct. Or how much better or faster are users when performing a certain task using my application compared to a previous version or compared to a different application. So again, version one or version two, and I, my, I assume that version two is better than version one, so I'll, I test both and then I compare them. Or I test them against the, uh, the competition also, right? These are some, uh, some questions that you could ask in your, in your research. Takeaway number three, there is no perfect research. Um, this, this is related to the next few things that we're gonna do. You are never gonna get a final, perfect, conclusive result about anything that you do research on. Even if you do large scale research and your methods are great and wonderful, whatever uh, results you get are never gonna be the final word in that subject. Okay? because there is no perfect research. Your research could also be, could always be reproduced by someone else to get more data, could always be improved. So it's never perfect. And this is related to the fact, this is inherently related to the fact that when you're doing some statistical inference or some research, you are actually measuring values from a population of interest that is impossible to measure as a whole by definition because if you can if you can measure a population as a whole if you could then you wouldn't be doing statistics you would be just measuring them and then just getting whatever number it is that you want to, to get it, right because then you would have the entire population at your disposal you have a conclusive measurement of every single element that exists related to whatever it is you're doing. But for you, for the questions that you're gonna ask, and for our most research anyway, that's not possible. You cannot measure the whole population of interest. So you need a sample. A sample is basically like a small part of that population of interest. That sample you can, you have, it's accessible to you. So you can measure the sample. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're building an application that will help elderly people use the internet in whatever way, it doesn't matter right now. What is your population of interest? Well, your population of interest is elderly people because you're trying to help elderly people. So when you're actually going to test whether your application actually helps elderly people use the internet. The only way you would have a completely final, conclusive um, answer to that is if you could get every elderly person in the world or in Sweden, if, if, if you're only interested in Sweden, 
you could you have you would have to get all of them <laughs> that exist and put them in a computer and do something that you want them to do right even then i mean that wouldn't even then that would be that wouldn't be complete but anyway let's just uh, play with that notion the only way you would absolutely have a final answer to your question would be if you did that but you obviously cannot do that right that's the same if you're like for example measuring you develop a game and then you're you have some question about your game like how long does it take for players to get to level 60 or something i mean maybe maybe you have the information of all the players and then maybe you can actually do that i guess in this case supposing that you're actually storing information about everyone in your computer but maybe not maybe it's it's maybe you're not storing that kind of information maybe it's a single player game and people install it in their own computers and then play it offline let's say so you're not you don't and you don't know how long they they took to to get whatever it is that they got so again you have a population of interest which is too big to be measured that happens in every real world research and then so what you do is you take a sample from it right so you take a few of these people that are part of your population of interest and then you make this group the small subgroup that we call a sample now the real challenge here is how can I measure things about a sample? How can I understand, let's say, how can I infer, that's why it's called inference. How can I infer something from the population by looking at the sample? Because you can see, well, you know, I mean, I measured the sample, but I mean, that's not like, how can I know for sure that this small sample that I'm measuring actually represents the whole population of interest, right? Well, that's why we use statistics and we're gonna get there. But conceptually, it's important to understand what's your population. So a population is this big group of users or whatever, in, depending on what kind of data getting you're going to use, uh, you're going to do. This huge group of elements that it's impossible to measure, but then you're going to sample it. And then you're going to measure the sample. And from the sample, somehow, you're going to infer the actual values of the population. And that's why it's called statistical inference. And since the sample is never perfect, and since different people could get different samples, your research will never be perfect. And you just have to accept that and deal with that and discuss your research in terms of it never being perfect. Now, one important thing about uh, sample, about taking samples, is that you must you must try to make the sample as representative as possible a sample uh okay yeah in this case is yeah okay i guess uh, this slide maybe should go after this one but anyway you have to try to make the sample as representative as possible and the best possible representative sample is always a random sample when you just take randomly anyone could anyone in the population could be taken by chance, right? So for example, um, this, this, this question, are these combinations of sample population valid? So for example, the sample is random CS students from LNU, and the population is CS students of Sweden. So computer science in this case, uh, could be media technology, I guess. <laughs> um, so do you think that a sample of random students from LNU, computer science, is a is a valid sample for the population of computer science students of Sweden in general. What do you guys think? Can anyone tell me? Yes or no? Anyone, please volunteer step up or else I'm gonna point to someone. <laughs> okay guys. Niels, is is it what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you think that a random sample of computer science students from LNU is a representative sample for the population for for the population of computer science students of Sweden in general? It's okay if you get it wrong. No, no don't worry. <laughs> I'll just say yes. Okay. Neil says yes. There's no final answer to this, but I would say no. 
<laughs> you made no? Okay. I would say no. Why? Because if you took random computer science students from LNU, that is representative of the computer science students of LNU. Because the computer science students from LNU by themselves are already a population, right? Like you have a bunch of computer science students from LNU and because of constraints of your project, you cannot ask all of them a certain question because you, wanna, you want to measure something about the computer science students from LNU. Let's say, then you take a random sample of them. However, they don't necessarily represent all the computer science students of Sweden because they were not gathered from the whole population of computer science students in Sweden. A computer science student from Linköping, for example, was not included in the, in the bucket of people who could be randomly selected. A computer science student from KTH or from Gothenburg, they were not in the bucket where they would be available for being randomly picked because I'm saying I picked a random sample of students from LNU. So by definition, that is not a perfectly representative sample of the computer science students of Sweden, by definition. Could it be that some things that I measure from the computer science students from LNU could be extrapolated to Sweden in general? Yes. I'm not saying that finally it's impossible to infer anything about the computer science students in Sweden by looking at the sample of, population of, of people from LNU. You could, but in theory, theoretically, it's not a representative sample because computer science students from other universities were never in the buckets to be chosen in the first place. So they could never be chosen. So I hope that's clear, at least in theory, okay? Now, for example, I take a sample of all the customers of a Veco restaurant at a certain day and time. So I go there and I, and I ask everyone that's sitting there at that point in time. Is that a good sample for the population considered as being all residents of Equa? No. Not everyone goes to that restaurant. Not everyone goes to that restaurant at that at like a specific day of the, or, or of the week or something like this, right? There's a lot of unknown variables here that influence how, uh, when, and and how and where people go to the restaurant. So just going there and then taking that and then say, oh, I gathered some data about the residents of Echo. No, you didn't. Um, moviegoers picked randomly at different times and days of the week. So I go randomly in the, in the, in the cinema and I, at random times, like sometimes I go in the morning, sometimes I go in the evening, sometimes I go on the Monday, sometimes I go on a Wednesday, randomly. And then I pick someone from the cinema and I ask them something like, do you like coming to this cinema? Yes. In this case, yes. In this case, the, the representative sample is actually pretty good because I want to have a random sample of all the moviegoers of that specific cinema. So I have to consider that some people go to the movies in the afternoon, some people go late in the night, some people go, go on Mondays and some people go on Fridays. So if I, if, I, if I take that into account and then I randomly pick all possible, all possible times of the week, all possible times of the day, and I go there and I pick a random person also, not just like the person who is sitting on the top or the person, the person who is sitting on the bottom or anything like that, then yeah, that is a very good uh, sample for the, all the movie goers, goers of that specific, that specific cinema, right? So I, I couldn't say this is all movie goers of Sweden, right? Because I never went to any other cinema. So theoretically, that's not a good sample for any other cinema because only those, only the people who actually go there were actually part of the, the bucket. Then your friends and population, everyone. And this I just added here a little bit like a joke, but it's really like if you just pick some friends and then ask them something and then say, you know, everyone hated uh, a certain movie because I asked uh, three of my friends and they hated it. So everyone hated it. No, 
your friends are not a good random sample of uh, everyone. So if you ask something your friends from your friends, don't uh, expect that that answer will hold uh, in general. <laughs> but that's a bit of a joke. No. Um, so I already talked about this. The best possible sample is a completely random sample. That's rarely feasible, however. Very rarely, you can actually do a really random sample. So don't worry in your in, in your uh, research in your data getting if you can't do a, a random sample because that's just theory. Okay, in practice, that never almost never happens. Uh, so in practice, almost all samples are biased. What's a biased sample? A biased sample is a sample that has a tendency to either underestimate or overestimate overestimate the value that you're that you're measuring for example suppose that you're investigating how many hours on average a person plays video games right so i want to say on average how much how many hours do a person play video? even you can even think of like a swedish person or a person in veco you could underestimate it by interviewing people outside a restaurant for example so the fact that the, pe person, the people are in a restaurant does not necessarily mean that you're underestimating, but it's just that you're outside a place, right? Like you're outside a restaurant and you're picking people from that restaurant. So there is, there is no reason for us to believe that, that, that those people there are representative to the whole, right? To the whole of everyone. So... Uh, and you could over, overestimate it by interviewing people at an esports event. So, if you're at an, at an esports event, I kind of assume that you play a lot of video game, or at least like you like it. So, probably you play more than than average at least. So, if you just go there and you interview those people there, then probably you're overestimating the average number of hours that person person plays video games because those people play more than average. So it's absolutely fine to have biased samples because nobody is free from that. But it's important that you, first of all, try to be as, as representative as possible. And when you can't, you have to be ready to discuss, to identify the biases, discuss them, and then comp compensate for, for these limitations in your research. Okay? We're not going to talk too much about compensating right now because that's a bit complicated. But I, want, I will expect that you guys will at least identify and discuss some of the possible biases that will appear in your um, in your research, okay? Now, if we go back to that to that question, I turned up the volume. Okay, oh man. So if you if we pick up uh, again on that question where we we were thinking, look. I have a population and I can't measure the population. So I measure a sample. And suppose I have a good sample. Suppose I have a representative sample or a reasonably representative sample. How can I just trust that whatever I measure from the sample will actually hold when I look at the population, right? Because I mean, it's, it's a very, this, this very, very small, very restricted number of elements that I've removed from the population of interest. So how is it that I can simply assume that whatever comes from a sample actually holds true to the population? Because that's, it, of course it's not that simple, right? However, that was solved a long time ago when statistics first started being a thing. Because if it, if it hadn't, then we wouldn't be talking about statistics now, today because it wouldn't make any sense. But the truth is that people solved it way back when, like maybe 100 years ago. Um, so, so it turns out that mathematicians have proved that the sample mean is a very good estimate of the population mean. So actually, and that's pretty crazy, but actually you can mathematically trust that if you take a sample, of course, a sample with a good size and all kinds of details that we're not gonna discuss here uh, specifically, maybe next lecture, maybe in, uh, next week. But there is a mathematical foundation 
called the central limit theorem, which I will discuss again when we come back on the more like math lecture. Uh, but this central limit theorem has determined quite strongly and theoretically that if you measure a sample mean, you can expect that that is a very good estimate of the population mean, which is kind of crazy and has some, uh, some caveats, some buts, but, um, but in general, in an introductory course, that is enough. So you can trust, so basically you can trust the sample mean which is great. However, um, when it comes to the sample standard deviation, that's not so much the case. So you can trust the, tr the sample mean to be reasonably good for estimating the population mean, but you cannot expect very much that the sample standard deviation is a very good estimate for the population standard deviation. There's this little difference here in the formula. We're gonna come back to this, don't worry. It's a, so basically the formula is a little bit different for the sample standard deviation than the, for the sample population, for the population standard deviation, but still we use it and there are ways to use it and we're gonna talk to, about that later. The important part here is that we, we build this framework, right? Think of this framework. I need to answer a question about something that's impossible to be measured completely, okay, which is my population. Don't think of population just as people, okay, guys? Population is anything that's out of my reach, like any, any abstract theoretical group of elements that contains every possible measurement that could ever happen in, regarding my problem. And then I'm, uh, I have this, this, this infinite impossible to reach thing. Then I go there and I take a sample from that. So I take some elements from that. And then I measure, I use statistics that we're gonna see in details later, like mean and standard deviation. I take them from the sample. And from that, I hope that I will be able to infer something about the actual population, right? But then what, is that it? So yeah, I take the mean from the sample and I say, okay, the mean is X, so the population mean is also X and that's it? No, of course not. There is an extra step, which is testing your hypothesis, right? And um, your hypothesis is something that is this, you assume about what you're doing before you start. Now, let me say something. I, um, this is, it's three o'clock now. And um, theoretic, theoretically we have this, this uh, you know, time until uh, five, but I'm not going there, of course. I have, an, I have a, an appointment at half past three. So I can still kind of go on for 15 more minutes. And I, what I want to ask is, is anyone, does anyone absolutely have to leave or can everyone stay 15 more minutes? If you have to absolutely leave, please let me know. We can stay. As ASAP. We can stay. Okay, thank you. So I will assume that everyone can stay for 15 more minutes. If not, please let me know ASAP. Um, so, so remember at the beginning when I said, you, you start from a, from a certain assumption. Like for example, when you were testing, when you were talking about the drug uh, problem, when you, you're developing a new drug for a s specific kind of a treatment. Of course, your hypothesis is that the drug will actually work, right? The, the drug will help people get better from that specific disease. I mean, of course you assume that because where else, why would you even uh, be, make the drug in the first place? However, the way that um, research works is that you, you actually come up with this thing called a null hypothesis. Instead of actually coming up with the actual hypothesis that you think, you know, like my drug will work, my new drug will work. You actually start from a null hypothesis, which is the H0, which is the hypothesis that you think is not true. This hypothesis 
it usually represents current knowledge about something. So for example, what is the current knowledge about the drug that you just developed? It's the first, nobody ever tested. You just developed it, right? You just created it. So the current knowledge that you have about your, your drug is not no knowledge, actually, zero knowledge. So for all you can say, your drug is completely useless because you, you have absolutely no reason to assume that it otherwise. All you have is a hypothesis that it works, but you don't know because there is no information on that. So in that case, your null hypothesis is my drug does not work. Actually, my drug makes absolutely no difference in the treatment of the disease that I'm trying to treat. That's the only thing I can assume for now because I have absolutely no knowledge about that. And that is your null hypothesis because that represents what you know and that also represents what you th what you want what you think is not true because you think you think it's not true right i mean you think that your drug actually works uh but you don't know so so you you're you're going to try to reject it and that's the the most important point here a null hypothesis is something that you're trying to reject not to confirm this is confusing for the first time when, when we consider this, but I hope that slowly you will uh, understand the importance of doing it this way and not the opposite way, hopefully. So no hypothesis is something you want to reject, okay? Not something you want to confirm. Then you're, later, you're gonna do a hypothesis testing, which is basically, if you read here, it says, your hypothesis test means Assume that my hypothesis is true. Assume that indeed my drug makes absolutely no difference during the treatment. So I go out there and I take some data. I gather some data. I do a controlled experiment. I gather the data. Then I measure that data set. Then I get some measurements like the mean and standard deviation and so on. Then I got to ask myself, if my hypothesis was true, like indeed my drug does not help anyone, what is the probability that this data that I just gathered would have been gathered in the first place? Like what's the probability that this would have happened? Then this is really interesting because if the probability, if you measure the probability and the probability is really low, like really, really low, then you say, then you can say something like, look, my hypothesis is rejected. My hypothesis, my null hypothesis cannot be true. Because if it was true, I would never or almost never have actually observed the, the values that I did observe. I will let that sink in a little bit and I will keep on uh, talking about some other stuff and then we're gonna come back to this and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. But summary, null hypothesis, I want to reject it. Okay, I wish it's not true, but it could be. So it represents my current knowledge. Then I gather data, I look at my data, and I say, would I, would I have obtained this data set if my hypothesis was true? If the answer is no, then your hypothesis cannot be true, okay? And then it's rejected. In more concrete terms, common null hypotheses are the mean value of a population is X. Like the mean value of something is whatever. This comes from a certain current knowledge, current knowledge that you may have about uh, the population, right? So you assume something. Yeah, I assume that the mean salary for computer science professors is 32,000 uh, Swedish crowns. I'm assuming it. Maybe I read it somewhere. Maybe someone told me. Uh, I start from this null hypothesis. Then I go out there, I gather data, and then when I, when I take my data and I calculate it, then it says, actually, it's 35,600. The mean of my sample, right? And then you might be tempted, and this is where the hypothesis test really shows its, its, its value. Because... You assume 32,000, but your measurement showed 35,600. 
But so you might be tempted to say, I reject my hypothesis because 35,600 is more than 32,000. But the truth is that even if the hypothesis was true, even if the value was 32,000, you wouldn't have measured 32,000, okay? Because you, you've taken a sample, there is a variability, your sample may be biased, so on and so forth. So a little bit of variance is expected. So you could have like 32,300, for example. Maybe you measure and say, okay, the mean of my sample is 32,300. So you will never get the exact value 32,000 perfectly. That's not how statistics work, right? So there is a certain, a certain variance that is expected, and not only expected, but accepted, right? The only, the only way that you will actually reject your null hypothesis is if you're, the actual value that you measured is totally outside the accepted variance around your null hypothesis. And exactly what it means, all these things that I'm saying, we're gonna see next time. But I just want, right now it's just a conceptual thing. There is variance always. Every time you measure a new sample, it will vary. And it will vary from your null hypothesis. But you will only reject your null hypothesis and say, no, my null hypothesis is wrong if that value goes completely outside the accepted values. And that is the answer to that question. If my hypothesis was true, would I possibly have measured this thing that I measured? No. So your hypothesis must be, must be fake, it must be wrong because your data is not wrong. I mean, you measured it, right? So you know it. Um, another null hypothesis common is there is no difference between the mean values of two different populations. And in this case, it's the, it's the case of the drugs, the, the drug test. You have a group of people who did not use the drugs and you have a group of people who did use the drugs. Then you measure them. So let's say these are two populations, the population of people who use drugs, the population who, <laughs> not drugs, the, that specific drug, and the population who does not, does not use that specific drug, medical drug. And then you measure them. And then you realize that in whatever measure it is that you did, like how many traces of virus are in their body, left in their body. And suppose you do that. And when you compare them, there's no difference. And again, no difference up to a certain point because there will always be a little bit of difference. But if the difference is within accepted, uh, an accepted interval, then you, you will say, well, there is, no, there is actually no significant difference between these two means. So I have not rejected my hypothesis. However, if you realize that these two populations are very, very different outside of accepted values, then you will say, yeah, I reject my hypothesis because of my, my null hypothesis. Because my null hypothesis was that there was no difference. And I measured and I, I, I realized that there is a difference. And I realized that if my hypothesis was truth, this, I would, I would almost never have measured this thing. So my hypothesis must necessarily be wrong. And then I reject it, okay? Very important for you guys to understand that a null hypothesis is not a hypothesis. It's, it's the opposite of a hypothesis, right? Um, what's also very important for you guys to understand is that failing to reject the null hypothesis does not mean you accept it. What does it mean to fail to reject? Because you're, you're trying to reject, right? Let's go back to the drug test. I have a null hypothesis, which says there is no difference between these two populations, which means if you use the drug or if you not choose the drug, the results are exactly the same. That is my null hypothesis. I'm trying to reject it to say that the, yes, there is a difference. So that's the opposite of my null hypothesis. However, let's say that for some reason I gather data and I don't see the difference or I see a difference, but the difference is rather small. So it's not, it, it is within uh, expected, an expected interval, right? It, there is a difference, which kind of looks good, but it doesn't look, it, 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 it's not strong enough for me to actually say, yes, there is a difference. Uh, and then, so I, I failed to reject my hypothesis. I failed to gather evidence to point out that my hypothesis was wrong. 
that does not mean is right. That's, that's the most important question, uh, most important factor here. That result does not say, okay, actually, you know what? My drug is a failure, so give up on it. No, all that says is that the current knowledge, the current knowledge that says there is no difference, it stands for now because I could not disprove it. I could not destroy it. So for now it stands. You can still do other experiments in the future. That's how science works. There's never, there's never a final answer to anything. The current uh, knowledge stands. We still believe that the drug does not significantly improve the treatment, but maybe six months from now, someone comes up with a new experiment that is done in a different way or somehow they actually see the difference and then you might reject the hypothesis, right? So just keep it in mind, just because you did not fail, just because you did not reject the null hypothesis, maybe, maybe your sample was not good enough. Maybe there was something wrong with your method. Maybe there's some other variance or other external factor that you didn't consider, something. But don't, don't assume that just because you didn't reject it, then that means that's it, you accept it and the hypothesis is true forever, okay? One thing that's interesting about ask is, is you could ask yourself something like this, does the evidence that I collected make my null hypothesis look ridiculous? This is, this is in a nutshell, what it means to do a hypothesis test. So you say, I have a, a hypothesis and then I gather the evidence. Now, considered I gather this evidence, considering that I gather this data, does that make my null hypothesis look absolutely ridiculous? If the answer is yes, then you have rejected your null hypothesis. All right. Um, yeah, so I will have to stop here. Um, I had, Actually, just a couple more slides of this one and the next one that I wanted to talk about, but I, unfortunately, I have to wrap it up. Um, you can read this. I mean, th this example with There's No Life on Mars, this is interesting. I may pick it up next time. And, um, and just more concretely for the two previous cases, then just so we can wrap it up. Um, so if you, have, if, you have, if, if you have a hypothesis, like, Previously, I have a hypothesis, right? The mean value of population is X, but if I measured something and it's too different, and what too different means comes later. If it's too different from X, like it's likely different, okay, too different, then I've rejected my hypothesis because my data made my hypothesis look ridiculous. So I, re I reject it. If two measured sample means are two different to each other, again, slightly different, no problem. Two different, something is wrong. So it made my, my null hypothesis look ridiculous. Then I reject it, all right? Otherwise, and this is very important, otherwise nothing can be concluded. And by nothing can be concluded, I mean we, go on with our current knowledge. We still don't know if it's true, but we go on with it. And maybe tomorrow someone comes up with a new experiment to reject this null hypothesis, okay? So I hope that with this, you have the necessary tools to actually write your data gathering proposal fully. Um, you can send it to me whenever you want. You don't have to wait for the deadline. You can send them to me via first class. I will try to watch it as much as I can. Uh, and I will, I know that I've already gotten some, um, and I didn't answer, but in the next few days, I will start reading them and answering them. Uh, and you just can, you can just keep them coming. Um, and then but and, and with with these slides, I will publish these slides on first class. I will send them to you, and hopefully, uh, with this, you have the tools to write the first draft of the proposal, and then you come back with the first draft of the proposal, and then next week, 
actually next week you don't have a lecture, right? I guess we don't have a lecture last week. Actually, we're going to discuss the proposals next week instead of having a lecture, which is which is fine because I think you don't you don't need more details than this in order to actually plan your data gathering. You will need more details later when you need to analyze it. Actually, right? Um, but that's it, guys. If you don't, if you have any uh, urgent questions, I can take them now. If not, I unfortunately have to go. So just otherwise, just send them to me via email or via, actually via first class, and I will answer anything as, as fast as I can. Even today, I can, I can come back today and, and answer questions if you want via first class today. But unfortunately, right now I have a meeting, so I, I need to, to be there. It's an important one. Um, so if you don't have any urgent questions, that come up in the next few seconds. <laughs> I will say goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much, guys. Bye. See you later. It's very good. It's very.